All right, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Conspiracy or Just a Coincidence. So today I have my favorite guest, the one and the only, the odd man. Odd man, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. I'm, I'm glad to be back behind the mic. I've been kind of under the weather for a couple of weeks, coughing my head off. So I'm, oh, I'm really glad no. to be back, man. Yeah. You think it's uh, the the thing that shall not be named? <laughs> I don't think so. I, it, it was, I got a little cold and I decided to blow the leaves and we've had more leaves than I've ever seen in my life. Okay. And I, I was an idiot and I didn't uh, wear a mask to cover up and it was so dusty. And the next day I got so sick and it was just, it was just like in my lungs. That was the only thing. It was just like this horrible, horrible cough. <laughs> Damn. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better, dude. Thanks, man. Thank you. Dude, I, today, before we get started, I had the, my, my, uh, fiance thought I was, I was at Wegmans grocery shopping and I'm wearing Sam Tripoli's um, one, like the, the shirt with Bill Gates. And then there's like a globe and it's that one quote where Bill Gates, they're like, should we look into the adverse, you know? And he was like, no, don't do that. That'd be bad. And he has a shirt like that. And I have this guy in front of me and he, he's got a mask on and he keeps looking at me. So I'm like, all right, we're, you know, there's something going to happen here. Like he's going to say something. And then and he, he turns around and he goes, are you gay? And I said, what? And he said, are you gay? And I said, no. And then he said, oh, cause you're cute. And then that was it. And then just walked <laughs> away. It was the oddest thing that I've, <laughs> I've ever experienced. I thought I was getting ready for him to like, say something crazy, you know, <laughs> like something about my, about my shirt or how I wasn't wearing a mask. And no, it was that it was just so <laughs> odd. Dude. That was like, I just didn't know how it was the craziest thing. That's really forward, but I yeah. it was a compliment instead of an alteration. Right. Exactly, dude. I, so I guess that's how girls must feel when, uh, you know. Right. <laughs> but, but anyway, so I wanted to first, I mean, we can start with, so I, I was telling Odd Man earlier for everyone listening, I was trying to do a show on symbolism at the White House and in the Feder, in the, I don't know, in the DC, and there is all this symbolism and we both had to stop reading the same book. So I started working on this book with another Anthony Sutton and everyone should go check him out about um, corporate socialism. And I never heard that phrase before. I don't know if you have, but for it just talks about basically how these guys at the top, they want a monopoly. Right. And it really reminded me of what you talked about with the Fabian socialists. And again, as I was just saying earlier, we always seem to mesh up. It's like fate, dude. We're just right. We're, we're like two sh sharks surrounding a, uh, the same topic, but could you tell everyone what you've done a lot of episodes on the Fabian socialists? What are the Fabian socialists? Yeah, they're a really interesting group. Uh, they started in 1884 in Britain and uh, it was a bunch of like intellectuals, upper middle class and uh, even wealthy kids who were kind of pissed off at the Victorian <laughs> era, you know, they were kind yeah. of lashing out against it. And, uh, so they decided to start this group and they ended up calling it the Fabian Society after this uh, leader who had uh, fought H Hannibal back in the day. And Hannibal was like this great leader who just destroyed all the armies. But uh, this guy, Fabia, uh, Fabius Maximus, I believe is his name. He uh, he decided that in instead of like trying to take on Hannibal, you know, he knew he would get decimated. So he was like, let's play the long game, wait for him to make a mistake and just kind of uh, sit back and let it all happen. And so that's where they got their name. But uh, they're really, really, I think, tied to even modern day politics, even though the people who are following their techniques may not necessarily you know, go by the word Fabian or may not actually be Fabians. And that's another interesting thing, too, because. They actually said uh, one of their lead leaders, uh, Sidney Webb, he said that uh, he didn't want them to have a lot of members, but he wanted people to take on their techniques. And so they immediately started uh, writing their uh, pamphlets and distributing them all around Britain. And uh, I guess back in the day at that time in the late 1800s, there were a lot of societies popping up, all kinds of different ones. And they were all kind of competing on trying to make the best tracks and pamphlets and all that kind of stuff. And these guys were, they had connections to the media and different people that were pretty high up in local government and whatnot. So they were able to start distributing these ideas immediately, pretty much. And uh, one of the main guys, probably the most popular 
of the Fabians was George Bernard Shaw, and he was an author and I think a playwright as well. And of course, H.G. Uh, Wells, the famous uh, you know author, and I think he was a playwright too. Uh, he was a member for quite a while. Uh, you know, he wrote the Open Conspiracy mm-hmm. and uh, New Worlds for Old, and um, what was the other one that he wrote? That was a it was basically like a a book to explain how to create a world socialist state. Um, oh, nice. Nice. New world order. It was called new world order. Yeah. Oh, good. So, um, yeah. So he was a big proponent of the Fabians and so was uh, Annie Bizant. She was like the lady that took over for, uh, Helena Blavatsky and the mm-hmm. Theosophical Society. So yeah, man, th- their thing was, uh, they called it Fabian permeation. And so right off the bat, they were talking about, we're going to infiltrate governments and, the private sector. We're not going to just try to fight these capitalists head on. We're going to infiltrate them. And so Mm -hmm. that's what they immediately started doing. And around that time, he he had people like Carnegie and different people like that, who he was famous for saying he never met a socialist he didn't like. So these guys (laughs) kind of had that. (laughs) So these guys kind of had a lot of those guys had that mentality. And uh, just to finish up, like uh, David Rockefeller actually went to the Fabian Socialist London uh, London School of Economics. They started the London School of e- Economics, and he did his uh, thesis on Fabianism. So uh, the Rockefellers started giving a lot of money to the Fabian Socialists for the London School of Economics. And right there is a huge tie-in with the you know the the big moneyed interests. Mm-hmm. But but they always really had um, connections to those guys. They had connections to a bunch of these uh, like. Um, Lord Haldane, I think he was a British PM. He was I remember a member of, his name from World War One. Yes, yeah, yeah, he was a he was in with that whole uh, Cecil Ro- Rhodes Lord Milner group, right. but also he was a Fabian too. So, and George Bernard Shaw would uh, have dinners with uh, the the Rhodes Roundtable guys, and and actually Annie Bizant went on to uh, she dated George Bernard Shaw for a while, but she eventually left. And ended up dating W.T. Stead, which was like Cecil Rhodes' right-hand man there for a, a long time. Wow. Right? So, yeah, he, he wrote the uh, Last Will and <laughs> Testament. So you have these weird, this, this socialist class hanging out with this capitalist class, and it's just a, a mishmash. So the, the line is very thin there, you know, and I think it's still that way today. Well, that's so. Uh, this book that for ever, anyone who wants to check it out, I think it's FDR and Wall Street. And Sutton does Anthony Sutton. He does three books. You know, uh, Hitler, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, and all these guys how they're funded by Wall Street. And it's just and I I came to that conclusion before. Like, all right, these guys at the top, they they say they're capitalists, but they don't care. That's why they funded the Bolsheviks. But it's a mate like just like these guys in England in the fate. I mean, they were predominantly England, right? Fabian socialists. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. But like even here you had all like Morgan and Rockefeller and they would fund these guys to write books or like pamphlets just because I guess that was the way to pass information then about how like uh, we're, we should we need to grow past this dog eat dog world. We need to cooperate. And even things like how FDR passed the New Deal with. In, or like, you know, the, the a big proponent then was like, oh, to get unemployment, to get um, disability, all these things like that. And there was this guy who before FDR wrote the New Deal, he it was a sponge or something like that. But he he said all these things and he wanted to mandate that these companies had to do that. If you had over 50 employees, you had to provide health insurance and all these things, which sounds good on paper. But it Obviously, now, if you are a small business trying to grow, you're not going to be able to do that because you can't afford to pay all your people insurance and to stay afloat. And they they made these rules to sound like, oh, we're helping the working man. We're going to help you. But they weren't. They were doing that to, to eliminate competition. And look yep. what we have today with um, climate. That's going to come next. If you have over 60 employees or whatever, you're not you're going to have to pay either a climate tax or. What whatever they you know however they're going to do it they're do it some way to knock out competition even more. Yeah, it's like it's like a tool. It's like you know, Quigley Carol Quigley says in a couple of different places in uh, Tragedy and Hope that that whole Rhodes Roundtable 
class, those guys would work with the communists. They would work with the socialists. They would work with the capitalists, the fascists. And they didn't care because the ends justifies the means, right? Mm. And so, you know, you see that. And um, it's, it's just amazing because a lot of these, like, there's a famous video. Somebody actually had a video of George Bernard Shaw. He was pretty old at the time, still a Fabian. He, he died a Fabian. He always was connected to that group. But uh, he was talking about how if people wouldn't support themselves, they should kill them humanely. So he went from, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's your death panel right there, you know. Right. So he went from uh, being like this bleeding heart to, to this uh, pretty, uh, I don't know what you would call that. I mean, that's pretty cold blooded to me. Right. I mean. You know, I do think people should pull their own weight for sure. But to say just uh, kill them humanely, right. maybe put them in one of those new pods that they've been talking about. I mean, that's where these things lead to, you know, when you yeah. let these kind of people in charge. Well, and I even found so I also started like I'm so lost now where I stand politically, because, as you know, I was like leaning towards it's been going on forever. This elite mm -hmm. class has been a parasite to the rest of us like. It start like there was an example in the 1300s in England. Um, they had like the tanners, you know, like what do they, I guess they do like things with animals, right? Is mm -hmm. that what a tanner does? Something yeah. with the skin, right? Right. I think they make like coats and hats and okay. shoes and stuff yeah. like that, I think. So there was a tanners group and the king and they greased the palms of the legislation. And for the good of the pe for the good of the consumer, they made all these rules like about what you could what you could, you could trade with, who you couldn't trade with, all this government regulation. And it wasn't for the consumer. It was to price fix and to make sure no new tanners were going to come up and have a better product and knock out. And like, it's just, and that was in the 1300s. And also like um, FDR, who was so, he was in like an elite bloodline, his distant relative in 1841 wrote about all this stuff the same way about how, uh, we need to get out of this free market laissez-faire. We need to elect a grand marshal or pick, choose a grand marshal who you will either fall into five classes, like, you know, chemicals, raw materials, whatever it is, these five groups, they'll choose which group you go in and that's where you'll be. And it's all these, it's Marxist stuff. And it's, we're supposedly, you know, great America in the 1850s. And he didn't get heat for it, right? Like people agreed with that. So it's like, I just don't know where, like all these people are such liars and it's just insane. It's just insane. It is. There's no end to it, you know? And, and it's like, I know you probably feel the same way. It's like the more you look into these things, the more you realize that everything is connected or nearly everything by, whether it's by members or groups or just ideas. And uh, it's hard to know. We're, I mean, there, there just doesn't seem to be an end to it. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so scary and overwhelming because you feel like, well, I could just spend my whole life looking into this and never get to the bottom of it. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, you're absolutely, dude, it, it does. It just keeps going. And like, and it's also was amazing, like how the, and I, we all again know that the press has been corrupt forever, but like, what I was reading out that was that Dulles book by David Talbot and he, he ranted and raved about FDR and anyone with a D and, you know, he shit on Dulles and all the R's as rightfully should. And then this book, like F, like I just said, FDR's the Delano side were elite Roosevelt's been, you know, have been congressmen or politicians since New York began. Like none of these people. And, and like, there was this one scam that FDR did, he, I mean, he was rubbing shoulders with Wall Street all the time, but he, you know, so they, they chose the chancellor after Germany lost World War I. Mm -hmm. So they, they chose the chancellor and he drove the, the Frank or the Mark down to, he knew he was purposely driving it down, you know, like right before Weimar Germany and FDR and all his buddies, they paid him to do this. Then they came in when it crashed, they swiped everything, all this land, all this property, all this stuff. For pennies on the dollar, then they resold it after once like the Hitler came into power and started driving it up. Like these people are just such scumbag. Like there is no, there's there's they're just all evil. They're just so evil. Yeah, 
Yeah, and they uh, so many of them hide behind these philanthropic groups. You know, they do a little good so they can have that great PR. And of course, the media they own half of them, and the ones that they don't own, they still fawn over them. You know, and and like you're saying with David Talbot, so many of these guys who write these awesome books that are exposés that really shed light on things that need to be, you know, exposed. They can somehow, because they're still, I think, so indoctrinated into the left-right paradigm, mm -hmm. they they overlook their side in the whole process. And you know, and it, you look at these these groups that we're talking about, especially with the the, the Rhodes guys, and so many of them lean the left. But it, you know how it is at the top, though. It's it's not exactly like left-right even means that much. It's just a, you know, it's just a a term or a, a label that they can use to uh, get what they want or even use reverse psychology against the opposition to get what they want. So <laughs> yeah, they do. And I think like the only disagreement that I've like was, have seen now from reading is like with the, the corporate socialism and the Fabians is like people in the government, they want the state to be in charge of the end goal is definitely a monopolized culture where there is no upward mobility. You are, there would be no labor strikes because you would be replaced, thrown in jail. There is no change. So, but the only disagreement is who's going to run that system. And I think that's like mm -hmm. where the biggest disputes come in. Like, well, is it going to be the, the Rockefellers of today, the Bezos, the Elon Musk, or is it going to be the politicians who will never then leave office? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, even the ones that start off with good intentions, I think once they get that power, it, it just, it's like the old saying, it corrupts them, you know, mm -hmm. and you just can't have these people making all these decisions for thousands and thousands of others when they don't live in that area. They don't know those people. They, they're just going on uh, suspicions and, and it's just, it's just crazy what they think they can do. And, you know, the more, the bigger government gets, the more they talk about um, wanting <laughs> diversity, it's really, I don't think they want diversity. They yeah. want us all to kind of fit into their like gray system. You know, we'll yeah. all have to have, you know, the same rules, the same exact, you know, you, you, you know, they want us all to be at the same level economically, which is only one way to do that, of course. And that's to destroy the the middle class which they're doing a pretty good job of it now i so. think you nailed it dude because that's the conclusion i came to today because i'm doing my notes on that book and i think the 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 diversity requirement in this woke thing is like two it's two fronts it keeps you so you can't you you can't organize because you hate the next person you're told to hate them so you'll never organize against the the parasite class and then also you if you like do this, you're going to, this equality focus is how you knock everyone to the same level. And that's the goal. You need everyone at the same level. And what have they done in since the new deal, like the new deal, it's again, all these things, they sound good, like, oh, help backup plan, a safety net, but they're not, they're, they're really is just knocking out to create a welfare state. And then, yeah. And that's what they're, and that's why they force this diversity training and all these things so hard because if we can remove like this equality, oh, he should have the same as you or whatever, then we're all going to be the same and stuck at the bottom. Yeah. And, you know, these huge bills that they come up with, and especially, you know, like you say, the left, because they appeal to that welfare state, you know, side of things. But the thing is, when they pass these huge bills, the majority of that money ends up going to their the crony capitalist class, you know, their buddies. It goes to right. their friends. And, uh, so they're just as much capitalist as the the right is. They just hide behind this, you know, this philanthropic kind of thing and this we want to help everybody be equal. So there's really no difference. It's just a difference in approaches. You know, they, yeah. they say a few different things, but they're mainly the same. And, you know, but they they don't really have to worry about people waking up to that because they've got people so <laughs> brainwashed. You're absolutely. And that's, I, that's another, that's probably why they create that because we, if everyone would realize like we are just being tricked and lied to, there's so like, there's so many things we could be. So we would come out with pitchforks, but instead we're arguing like, ah, oh, you shouldn't invite your family member who didn't elect to get a medical procedure to your Christmas and all. And it's just so like the removing of community, that's again, another successful thing that they've done because 
Now, again, we don't talk to our neighbors. We don't talk to our kin's folk or our neighborhood because you don't, you, you might not like them. Maybe they're wearing a mask. And another way that you can make sure people will never organize and never talk about, wow, this is really screwed up that they keep doing this to us. It's it, like they are brilliant in their planning. They really are. And, you know, it's like the deeper you look into it, the more you realize how bad it really is. And you, you know that the average person has no earthly idea. And it's like, how could you ever get through to this person? Because they're still watching the news thinking it's just this left right thing. And they don't understand the depth of the the, the infiltration and the techniques they're using on us and, and how long they've used them on us. And it's just it's so mind blowing. And, yeah. you know, I, I've been looking at them. You know, a lot of people have written the books about the Council on Foreign Relations, you know, and I know I talk about that a lot, but, uh, you know, they have all these connecting groups. Uh, the fellow that I've been having on for the Pilgrim Society, I think he said they had like 2000 connecting groups and I haven't found that many, but I've found I just keep finding more and more of these world affairs councils or you know, the different councils on foreign relations in other countries. And some of them have a little bit slightly different names, but they're all connected to the Council on Foreign Relations and, and Chatham House. And it's worldwide, you know, Russia, Germany, uh, Deutschland, you you name it, dude. And New Zealand, Australia, Africa. So, you know, and I don't know how much power each one of those places have. But it just goes to show you that this organization has spread all over, you know, all over the world, basically. And they are helping to control or even write the foreign policies and probably the economic policies of these countries. And they all kind of have that link to England at Chatham House and the CFR in New York and Washington. Mm. It makes me I would like your take. So World War One, like, you know, I used I still kind of believe it was a Republic to remove the monarchy and that way they could come in there because, and, you know, do what they did to us with a Republic and just corrupt everything. And whether that's true or not, I don't know, but what do you think that these, I mean, obviously world war two, they, it was a war they wanted to happen. They propped up Mussolini. They propped up Hitler, wall street popped up, propped up Russia and now China, but I, I wonder like World War One, I, I feel like that was like a, a tipping point where it uh so do you think that that was an actual fight or it was another planned? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. I, I that's a great question. They wanted to destroy Germany because it was kicking Britain's ass, you know. They mm -hmm. don't you think? I mean, yeah. they were just killing it. Yeah. So Germany had to be destroyed. And I think that we probably uh, not us, of course, but leaders uh, either in the private or public sector or both have probably been somewhat in control of Germany ever since uh, the end of World War II. Yeah. Probably even were in, you know, inside the government at some point uh, during uh, World War II. But, um, and they may have, you know, it's crazy because, you know, like they were doing business like uh, New York and uh, uh, Britain, the British bank or the London bank were doing business with the, Bank of International Settlements and the Bank of International Settlements was doing business with uh, Hitler and, and the Nazis the whole time. And the, Del the Dulles was working with them and right. they didn't want to interrupt the economics of the whole thing. Yeah. They wanted to keep the, the money flow coming in no matter what. So it's really it's a tangled web. But I think that they wanted to at least make the people fool the people with World War World, excuse me, World War One and uh push us into that league of nations. Cause that's really, I think they thought they could get that done. And yeah. when they didn't get that done, I think it really made them angry. And uh, I think that's when they decided, okay, we, we are going to uh, basically get together and plan a conspiracy mm -hmm. because they started planning the United nations immediately. And that's when they formed uh, the Royal Institute of International Fa Affairs and CFR right after that, not, not long after that. And the, and the, uh, the t round tables that were before even uh, Chatham house. So I think they were like, damn it, we've got to do something. <laughs> Our plan didn't work. So we've got right. to figure out another way. Well, you were, they were Germany. I just read too, like they, you know, the Zeppelins, that was their, you know, they had the patents on that. 
And that was, and not saying this was the reason for World War One, but after World War One, you know, we came in, we raped their country, not as again, not we, but Anglo Western world and the patents. So they're supposed to come, we get the, the war office gets there. It's called the alien like asset, whatever. So they get these patents and they got the creator in Germany still alive. They bring the patents back. And the rule is in the constitution, I forget what section is like, oh, you're supposed to have an auction. And for any property that you seize in a foreign place, you bring it back, you have an auction, it goes to the highest bidder. Well, FDR worked out this deal where it went to, um, you know, like the normal characters of Wall Street. They get the patent, they pay the guy, the guy, the inventor, like a few, you know, some money. And then they're, they sell it back to the U.S. Navy and like they get involved with Bill. It's just crazy. Like these, they, they took all this thing from this country and they totally neutered it. And that's, it's just weird how it got built up again with their help. So it's, it's just like how much is planned chaos? Like, I don't know what I'm, it's just a yeah. very, it's such a difficult web. Like you said, to untangle what, what's real and what's WWE. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, FDR's son-in-law, uh, Curtis Dahl, he wrote a book called uh, My Exploited Father-in-Law, and it was all about the CFR. Uh, he, he claimed that his dad was just, or his uh, father-in-law was totally fooled, like just, I, you know, wasn't that smart, and he got fooled by all these intellectuals in the CFR, and they put, they put their uh, headquarters right beside his house. Uh, and I did not know that. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But his I can't remember if it, it was his niece or his daughter. Her name was Kermit Roosevelt. And she was a, I think she was in the media, but she wrote some things about the conspiracy and she was pretty open about it. She said it's it's true that there's this group that's, you know, Damn. basically using the government like puppets. And uh, I thought that was pretty interesting because, you know, she probably had some inside uh, information there. Yeah, well, there's that nice Roosevelt quote, and I'm looking forward to my notes where he's like, "There, oh, a financial element larger in the larger cities has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. And that was it. And he knew that because, like I said, he worked in Wall Street the 10 years, and he something like uh, 75% of his funds to run for president was was within a one mile radius of 120 broad street you know where the, i think that's wow. rockefeller building right but 72 percent, so. dude like and ever again we i'm just going hitting this point again like people will write fdr and the new deal he he wanted he brought us out of the depression that was put up we we got put in purposely by was it uh who was it wasn't i don't think it was hoover but who by the bankers by jp morgan and rockefeller to knock out these banks like our history were is just so warped that what we think is the good guy and the good, it's just so unfair. Like we are battling against a, a trillion dollar industry that can every, since we were little kids, like you were brainwashed with this stuff that who's a good guy, who's a bad guy. And they're all bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you look at the average, especially around the presidential voting time. And you realize it really is to like 90, probably 95% of the people it, it really is just a popularity contest, you know, so some guy will say a few, I can't remember the book I was reading the other day, but it said, you know, when we choose our president, most of the time, it's some guy that you barely know, or maybe you've never even heard of until he decides to run. And he says a few things you like, and then all of a sudden people are getting behind this guy 100%. Mm. But, you know, you would not really do that in your personal life. You'd still have questions about somebody, you know, if you didn't know them. You wouldn't, and, but they're putting all their faith in these guys who are supposedly making these really important decisions, but we know that it's probably not really them. Uh, but uh, it's just no, it's right. sad, man. It's really sad. And it's like tearing people like this, the fighting, like it's just, and it's just so sad. Oh, I also wanted to say two things, but like uh, Delano family of, of FDR, they trace their family back to 600 BC in Rome I know Johnny wow. Cerucci would like that because, uh, you know, yeah. uh, but I found I was like, I can't trace who can trace their ancestors back to BC times. No, unless you're, um, power, unless you're yeah. true power. 
And then what was he? Oh, also he shares comedy ancestry with John Adams, James Madison, John Quincy Adams, Zachary Taylor, Andrew Johnson, and even Taft, Benjamin Harris, Ulysses Grant, all wow. these guys dude, like, and that goes back to, I made me think of uh, 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati. Yeah. And I think Roosevelt's in there. I think his, I think so. Yeah. 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 And, and that's interesting too, because of the modern presidents, you know, you don't hear too much about the Freemasonry aspect, but then both Roosevelt's were Masons and that's pretty well known and accepted. I don't know. It's just one little thing I think is interesting right. about it, you know? Well, speaking of free, so I, I mentioned how we read that same book. And if anybody's good at like astrology, you can reach out and maybe you can read the book and tell me what it's about because it's so confusing. But we both were working on this book. It was like what, secret. What was uh, it? What's the title? Secret architecture. Yes. Or... Our nation's capital. Yeah. But like, I never knew like this was, it, they truly like the, George Washington, as we all know, was a big Freemason. Like everything they did was on the sky. Like the day they put down the cornerstone that they showed we're going to build the white house. Um, you know, something was 20, like the moon was 23 de degrees in Jupiter. And the next time then they, when they were about to build the Capitol, it was the same thing. It was something else was 23 degrees in Virgo. And like the, the chances of this happening by luck are, you know, a billion to one and all these, like everything they did, they picked how that hit, like uh, what's it? Capitol Hill. It was called Rome. It was owned by this guy named John Pope or David Pope, and he called it Rome. And it, it's just like all this sim. They truly believe that they were creating Rome 2.0, and uh, just and I wonder if that plays in also to this utopia that they're trying to like create. Yeah, I think it must. It, it must play into it, and you know, it just makes me wonder. Like uh, I was listening to something the other day and they were talking about the Washington Monument and that's pretty, you know, it's pretty clear. It's a phallic symbol, you know, kind of like to the, and also a, kind of a yeah. tribute to the sun God, whether it's Ra or one of the Osiris or one of the others. But, um, you know, they have that many, uh, I think it's like 60 feet away or something like that. And it's down in a manhole. You have that miniature uh, Washington Monument down there. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. And um, whatever I was listening to now, I, I didn't look to confirm it. But supposedly there's something hidden underneath that monument that uh, that uh, they put in there to open up one day as a, you know, as a surprise. It's, it's got something to do with the Freemasons. So interesting. You know, I know uh, uh, Isaac Weishaupt's gotten into the whole, uh, I think, the Osiris symbolism when they yeah. bring a new president in and all that. And right. This, there's a certain amount of steps and then you got the apotheosis of Georgia Washington up on the dome yeah. on the inside. It's all these crazy things. It's uh, and dude, it's just definitely like true because the yeah. even like uh, Albert Pike, like so there were the first electric electricity lit in Washington, D.C. was the Columbia statue that somebody built with again, like the certain they built it. I'm just making this up copper because the guy that they, it was in the Smithsonian, the guy who like they were honoring or the Smithson, the guy that, you know, they built the Smithsonian or was named after he dealt with copper. So they built it out of copper and lead inside, like all these things. And that they just, they tied these together. And while all this is going on, Albert Pike and people of high political power have were organizing this obelisk to be shipped from Egypt to the United States, which clearly in like the 18, you know, after World War II, after the Civil War, which would be a huge undertaking to ship this huge monolith. And that's what they were focusing on doing. And think of all the people involved to get that monolith shipped from Egypt on a boat to America. Like there's something here that is so driving these people to do insanity. Insanity. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of goes back to Manly P. Hall, who claimed, you know, that, uh, you know, like a lot of these guys, it seems like they really pattern a lot of things after Plato. It seems like he was like the guy, the go to mm -hmm. guy with a lot of these ideas about this utopia, utopian society and stuff like that. I know Pythagoras was another one because of the numbers and stuff like that. But I think Plato was even bigger. And he, t he talked about the uh, philosopher kings and, and Manly P. Hall claims that. The ancient Egyptians knew of the land of America, you know, and they were going to get here one day and create this utopia and oh. uh, philosopher Kings. And, uh, 
you know, that's all we need is some smart ass philosopher kings. You know, these, these, I mean, we're already, our world is already ran by these intellectuals who think they know everything, you know, yeah. it's like, I don't know, man, maybe we just need somebody who has some good old fashioned common sense. <laughs> right. Dude, I agree. We absolutely, <laughs> they also, it was insane too. Like when they're building the, 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 the white house or they're mapping out DC, which was an odd, it was a swamp before it was DC. It was called foggy bottom and no one, none of even the Indians didn't live there because it was a swamp. And it's just funny. Metaphorically, it's still a swamp, still right? a swamp, it, right? We can change the, <laughs> the art, the layout, but you know, God has like a way of come, but they like just found Mars at this point And, or no, they found the two moons of Mars right as they're like breaking ground or something. But what was weird was that Gulliver Travels. Do you know that book? I've I've heard of it, but I've never read it. I don't there's know much a, about either it. have I, but there's one they it's he's you know, it's a famous book. I think it's with like a yeah. giant, right? I, I'm pretty sure. And there's like little people that time down. But he mentioned and he said that Mars, because Mars was a big topic, like H. G. Wells wrote about, and he um said that it had two moons before they were discovered. And he also even did the rotate how fast they would go around Mars. And he was, it was, he said it went around 10 hours. It would take 10 hours to go around. And it was only seven and a half hours. Like just so much weird stuff with this. And all these guys were sky watchers, every single mm -hmm. one of them. Like ev they, they would study it like, you know, to the, just how the, the uh, pyramids are in Orion's belt or whatever they are. They did the same thing with DC. You know, we used to, look up and now we only look down at our it's screens so true you know and, and i do think that people get too carried away with astrology and stuff like that you know i've been pretty vocal about that but yeah then again you know that's not my thing but i think that we can certainly learn from it and i think that uh for a hundred percent sure our past uh, forefathers and even before that these these people were watching the sky and they were patterning patterning is that a word <laughs> our world in our, our society kind of on the basis of some of those things. And so, and, and like, even where you live, like the Keystone state yeah. that, you know, the Keystone I was told by a Freemason is the, uh, is that, that center stone, mm -hmm. you know, that the Keystone that, that holds everything together. And uh, you know, we've had these several cities across America that have a lot of Freemasonry symbolism there. And uh, you know, there's no doubt about it. I mean, these guys, it wasn't just the, our founders in Washington, D.C. It was in a lot of the other surrounding states as well. Yeah. And that was another like it was so when, you know, everyone's getting telescopes now. They built like an observatory behind you know, on the Naval Observatory in like the 1800s. And there were some people that wanted to they were it was in like the, the scientific journal. They would have astrology in a scientific journal like oh, Mercury is rising in Pluto or whatever. And that means this. And that, that crazy that was in a scientific journal, but also that, so they start printing it more. And then the, these people at the top, these Freemasons, they X that. They said, I don't want the public to know this, these things, like they can't handle it. So keep it out. But it's just, again, it's again, like this pattern of people at the top, not they, they want to hold everything from the people because we're stupid and they need to guide us or we'd be like kind of an Ayn Rand uh, type of logic. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And, you know, I have a theory too, and I haven't like delved into it super deeply, but I almost feel like um, I was trying one of these days I'm, I'm going to do a show on astrology and kind of um, a, a, a sort of a semi debunking, and I think I'm really what I'm going to focus on is the horoscope, because I think that that might have been uh, a kind of a psyop because it started in the newspapers. I forget the guy's name. I've looked into it and it caught on. I think that, the, you know, like people who look at this stuff to find a mate or what's mm. going to happen at work. I think those things are irrelevant and not true, but I think there is a truth to it. And uh, I think that that has been that whole persona of, of your horoscopes and how this is going to affect your personal life, those kind of things. I think we're a diversion. I think mm. that they don't want us to know the real, all, all the things that like is talked about in that book and other things that are connected to it. Interesting. Yeah. I think, dude, you're right. If anything was, they wanted us, they would never print it. If it was yeah. a, 
crucial information they have never given you that and they will lie to you so i think that's to or it's like that that again we always talk about this that new age influence mm -hmm. and like there's it's just so especially now maybe like back then people were much more christian and comfortable with their faith and they would denounce anything that wasn't christian but now like we're so i mean th look at you from i mean you're on twitter you see how many like astrology and numerology and all these things are and i can't get behind it i'm like you maybe i'm like old in that mindset but like i just can't because it's like dude there's no way this is like a either positive thing in my life or a bennett like it it can't be it's it can't be good that's like my yeah. logic yeah and you know if you look through the ages it, it, it all was formed like the horoscopes and stuff like that the zodiac was formed slowly it didn't all just happen at once but we're not we don't think about that you know because we've just yeah. had it and so that's what we see but then different cultures have different animals you know and there's a lot of differences in these things and the egyptians had the decans which was not astral, you know, it wasn't the Zodiac. It, that all came later. And so everything has happened slowly over time. And But we don't, you know, because we live in the present, we couldn't see all those changes happening slowly. And so we just know what is now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's kind of hard to go back and, and see all these different changes and these these different, uh, what, what these different animals meant in different cultures to their Zodiac and stuff like that. So, you know, it's kind of a complicated thing, but, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it takes time to look into that stuff. Nobody wants to do that. They just want to open up. I mean, come on guys is the newspaper who we know the, the, the news has been trying to fool us forever. Are they going to give you like every newspaper you pick up has got your horoscope <laughs> in there? I mean, come on. It's not all right. It's just well, not dude, that easy, man. It, it, it's, you said FDR was probably a Freemason, right? Yeah, I, I've read that he was a Freemason, and I know that Teddy was a Freemason. I've seen his pictures. FDR is the one who designed. He, it was during his administration with the dollar bill, correct or no? I believe so. Yeah, and uh, because at first they didn't want to put the uh, the uh, the eye and the pyramid on. I think right. it, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, at first just had the eagle. Okay. And yeah, and that was done under FDR. I'm pretty sure. Well, it's and also like the or even our flag, like um. You know how, like, so the Egyptians they they did their their pyramids with this star, like Orion's belt. The one star is Betelgeuse, and it's like orange. And the Egyptians marked that star with a uh, with a, an up up a, a star, like a five pointed star. And that's the same stars that end up on our flag. And there's you know thirteen comes there. They say it's the thirteen states, but it's for thirteen signs or whatever that it is but it's just like all this there's a secret thing. and i know like it's like the the first step of conspiracy world is like a secret religion but there really is a secret thing going on here that none of us can figure it out or what's going on yeah absolutely man and it's like the more you look into these different secret societies and in these fraternities and that's what freemasonry is a fraternity uh, you know, they started out, they called, they called that those, uh, the, for the, the Freemason lodges, they called the different ones colleges at first. And so of course, you know, your fraternities are at colleges and, you know, there's like Yale's got like three of, of them. It's not just, uh, skull and bones. There's I think right. book and snake and, uh, what's the other one? Scroll, uh, scroll and, and key. And, yeah. Yeah. But these are these guys. I mean, you, you you know as well as I do, like the Skull and Bones guys. I mean, they, they basically created our education system and our yeah. health system. <laughs> right, they did I mean, it all. So, so these guys are connected to everything. And again, average people, you try to tell them that, and they think you're crazy right. because they've never looked at that history. They think, and that's another thing that drives me crazy, man. Especially on the more right leaning side of things, especially older people. You know, they talk about fake news under Trump and all that stuff, but then they don't want to they think that uh, the education system was just screwed up in the last decade or so. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, no, who created that education system? You have no idea. Right. Dude, I, <laughs> what uh, it's just. Yes. Yeah, so older people. I don't I it's literally since they printed since something's been on paper, dude, they've been lying and it's mm. just crazy. So I also wanted to talk about we. Uh, the debate. So if anybody didn't, there's a good entertaining debate between Nick Fuentes, who got me kicked off Twitter for following allegedly his alternate account. 
That's why I got kicked off. And then Dave Smith, who everyone should probably know if he's a big libertarian and I sent it to odd man. So we'll, so Nick, for people that don't know Nick, he's like a, what would they label him? All alt right guy. And he defended I, what, I guess like Trump or, or kind of like a, a I, I don't know if he's like an ethno nationalist or what do you think? What's a good, I guess anti-libertarianism. Yeah, I think it wasn't that kind of the thing, I guess, was Dave was trying to make the case for libertarianism yeah. and Nick was trying to say, OK, this is these are, these are my problems with it. Yeah. I, I was new to Nick. I've seen the name, but I, you know, I was still into libertarian stuff under Trump. So I just would see I knew that Nick was very controversial, but I didn't know anything about him. But he I thought he did a great job and I, yeah. I agreed. 90 percent of what he said probably yeah. you know and and i thought that dave did a great job too i mean and i, I really want to look at a couple of those books he was talking about of rothbard's where it supposedly was taking a, apart the bankers and stuff like right. that so I, I don't know those books but um yeah i mean i just got to where i think it's same as you I, I don't think libertarianism would work because uh there's no way to keep the this network that we're talking about the, mm. uh, the bankers and the industrialists and all those guys those guys control everything now but if there were no rules whatsoever they would control everything even more so right you know, and that's the way they would go they would push the monopoly if if there were no rules they would easily have the monopoly and now they realize they can't do that because people would be up in arms if you made them like slaves so this way they say no we're going to give you stuff you're still a slave but we're going to give you stuff and that'll keep you happy you know, like you'll have yeah. food, you'll have health insurance. You can watch as much Netflix as you want, but you won't be able to do any. You won't be able to rise up, but you you will be fed. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, uh, you think about it and well, the Rockefeller. So what did he do to get around any type of government uh, rules and regulations? Well, he just either bought off the government employees, uh, the appointees to these different cabinets and different positions, or he started these uh, philanthropic groups and they were allowed to basically influence and write policies with education and all kinds of stuff. And you see the Carnegie endowment, they're all over the education system and they're into these uh, geoengineering weather modification programs. And the Ford foundation is really heavy into the education system. And they're pretty much, uh, Communists, I mean, that's the only way I can say it. They're just straight out communists, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's what they do. They just, they've already infiltrated everything and uh, they control everything already. Right. And I don't think libertarians, I know for a fact that regular libertarians do not know that because they haven't been taught that because mm -hmm. they just follow these guys and they just talk about free markets and economics. Taxes and, is theft. Yeah. And then so, you know, they don't know that history and old libertarians actually talked about that stuff. Like um, that one guy that uh, Dave mentioned a few times. Um, oh, um, Lou Rockwell. So Lou Rockwell's his website's actually a pretty good website. He's got a lot of different uh, people on there who've written about the Rockefellers and the CFR and the bankers and different things like that. And so, uh, you know, the older libertarians actually talked about that kind of stuff, but this newer crew, I think it's sus suspect that they don't talk about it more because that's who's writing all the policies. I think it's probably like a lot of everyone just understands the system is corrupt. And so we're all just like cert and all anybody who's so sure of their stance, I like immediately can't trust you because I don't know if there is a, what is the answer? Like I, I do, like I used to, was just saying, like I used to kind of was leaning more towards this monarchy, a national, I know nationalism is an important aspect of it. You need that. But I don't know. It's just no. It's like humans are corrupt beings, and I don't know how you get around people not being parasites. Like I just mm -hmm. like we were a libertarian. We were started as a liber a perfect libertarian utopia, and look what happened. So how do you yeah. avoid that again? How you can How do you avoid that? I don't think you can. Unfortunately, you know, maybe in small pockets, but like they, they, people just are so easily fooled by people who tell them what they want to hear, you know, and, and then now the technocracy that's coming about and is here, I think it works hand in hand with just totally uh, subverting and, and infiltrating anything that was good and, and stood for good things and just things. I, I think it's it's there to totally turn that around and make us slaves, you yeah. know. 
and of course, you know, it's like I said before, they'll they'll try to give us some benefits and make us semi comfortable, but they want us all to be obedient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exact. And that's what they've definitely learned. It's easier. Maybe that's like these tests in like the Bolshevik Russia and all these places like these were all tests like, OK, let's see what happens if we create chaos. We enslave the populace with pure violence. What will happen? And we saw what happened. So it, it fell. People eventually, you eventually, once you lay your foot up off that gas of violence, people stand up. So that, okay, mm -hmm. we can check that off. What do we do if the state owns everything? Well, or whatever, you know, they've tried all and they've realized the best way is you give people benefits, which are cheap for you, for your corporate capitalist, socialist person. And uh, you give them bare minimum what they need. They will never stand up because- mm -hmm. And they have nothing, they, they can't rise up. So what are they going to stand up for? They, you know, you give them drugs and alcohol and crappy movies and they don't understand, they don't even realize they're in prison. They're not free. And mm -hmm. that's how you keep them enslaved when you can't see those bars. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Carol Quigley, uh, Bertrand Russell, Aldous Huxley, uh, the different guys wrote about what the future would be like. And we're really everything they wrote is coming true or has come true already. And it's almost like there was a plan a long, long time ago to do what's been done. And like you look at the uh, Frankfurt school, those guys, uh, you know, they were known to be mar cultural Marxists. I guess that's where the term cultural Marxist came from mm -hmm. in critical theory. And, you know, not everything those guys said were wrong, but uh, one of their things was they wanted to attack the patriarchy and no, Really? Yeah, because they thought that everything bad stemmed from having this strong father figure because he was too macho and he was just bringing this violence into society, all these different things. And, and at, at that time, I think that was in the 40s, uh, maybe even a little bit earlier, they were, uh, I'm sure there was a lot of violence towards women and whatnot, you know? I mean, there's no doubt that that has been a part of yes. the world. Yeah. But then as things get carried too far and we go and destroy the family now we see what the that has caused the the effects of that it's it's destroying the world yes and so you cannot destroy the patriarchy uh, i mean you it's not that they were, they just you know got rid of violent fathers uh, they destroyed the family and destroyed right. society so yeah you know what i mean <laughs> no and that's obviously a goal because we've seen that just more and more i mean whether it's porn or whether it's Instagram, even all of these things, they, they put, you know, they want you to look outside and it's like human nature to do this. And they, they say it's okay. And what polyamory and all these things to ruin. There is no, I just saw an article. There was like a, the kid's grandma gave birth to two gay dads for a child. Like, there's no way this can be a good thing. Like, this isn't good, dude. This isn't how we take a, and I always want to ask like super progressive people, like, do you think that's good? Do you think that's going to be a healthy, normal childhood with that? And I'm sure some of them are so brainwashed. They'll say yes, but I, I don't see how that could be. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they live in a fantasy anyway. anyway and most people do, yeah. you know, unfortunately, uh, it's the fantasy means way more than reality and, and their idea of what they want something to be means way more than the actual outcome of it. And we see that in politics and social issues and all kinds mm. of stuff. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, no, it's just, and like this social, and I used to think like, again, like this, this book really, like anybody should go check it out. Like it really is challenging my, like I'm having like cognitive dissonance. I can't figure out what sides up. I'm so confused. Like they're also like, you know, they always say, oh, they're socialists. You know, the right loves going in with the socialist charge. And I guess they are socialists, but I think all of them are probably, and that, that was such a great term. You use corporate socialists. And that's literally the exact system we have. And each step, each event that we get, they take more small businesses out, you know, like the, the Great Depression that knocked out small banks. And then you have each more government intervention is another tactic to to knock out more small. Like we I don't even we're not we're, we are there. We are yeah. a mon monopoly ruled by an oligarchy because there is yeah. no, I don't like Elon Musk. He's this rag to riches story. I'm sure he's not dude. I'm sure yeah. he's not. Yeah. He seems like the kind of the, the face, just like they put out these presidents and these leaders. He kind of seems like he's like the, the, 
person that they've put out there to, you know, because he, he kind of goes above and beyond just being the leader of Tesla. He kind of drives some culture, too. Yeah. And uh, you got to wonder, because we know that certain agencies have been into culture creation for a long time. <laughs> and so that's something that we need to think about. Yeah. Is that is that is that what, I mean, I see him on he like argues with Elizabeth Warren. And I know a lot of, again, what we need to stop defending people in like these uh, these blue check mark celebrities like to stop defending them. I see like people getting in fights like he's paid the most tax money ever in a single year and all that. Like none of these people care about you. None no, no. It, it, it's like it, it gets on my nerves because it's like uh, one of these celebrities or these people that's in the public spotlight, they can say a few things that one party will agree with. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all those people in that party think they're their best friend. Right. I remember when uh, Roseanne during, I guess it was during the Trump election, uh, the first one, or maybe a little bit after. Yeah. And she said something about uh, one of the cabinet members in Obama's cabinet. I forget her name now. Not Susan Rice, but there's another lady. But anyway, something to do with Planet of the Apes because her haircut looked just oh, like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. And so all these like Republicans are like, Roseanne's my woman. You know, she's she's awesome. I wish she would run as like, VP. <laughs> like, dude, she just ran like a few years ago as a Green Party candidate. And that's right. like as far away as you can get pretty much from the <laughs> Republican conservative camp. But people don't care, man. No. They just don't care. And it's one thing with Elon. Elon it's like. He's saying some good things. I agree with some of the things he's been saying, but also, you know, he's talking about, well, you're not going to beat this uh, technocracy unless you hook up your brain to right. the Neuralink system. Right. Like, we They're defending that he's, he's the guy that created Neuralink. He wants to yeah. hook your brain up to a computer. Like, yeah. And you know, the one thing I've noticed, libertarians, uh, conservatives and liberals and progressives, they all agree on one thing. And that is, you know, I've, I've argued with them about this. It's like the, uh, you know, the technocracy and the, and the AI and the uh, everything that's going, everything is becoming computerized and automated. And it's take it's going to take thousands and thousands of jobs. And we're just going to be all these, you know, it reminds me of Fight Club, like these aimless people, you know, yeah. there's going to be all kinds of weird shit going on. Yeah. And it's like, because they can, does that mean they should? Well, I talk to these people and they're like, that's just the way it's, it's just the way things are going. That's just the way things are headed. We can't stop it. It's just the way it is. Well, you know, you could, you know, if thousands of people said, I'm not going to do business with this company anymore because they're destroying all these jobs and everything's going automated, then, you know, they, they could get something done, but nobody wants to be uncomfortable for a split second, you know? Mm. No, you know, it'll never get automated. The DMV. <laughs> yes. Dude, I got, I'm about to get my regular license. And like, cause you know, I've, I've had lots of criminal issues. I'm about to get it. And so I have to like send them a check, which I don't have a check. Who has checks anymore? I'm, I'm right. 30 years old. I have everything <laughs> on my on the internet and I had to mail them a check. And then I got to wait. For, like, dude, you're telling me you couldn't put this on the computer. You're telling me that like, so the DMV will net, it'll, we'll have robot. I think there's a Dane cook joke. Everything's instant in the future. Like, you know, you get your food in a second. The DMV will still take like 30 seconds. You know, like <laughs> yeah. everything else is instant. Like it will. It will. It's horrible, man. It is horrible. <laughs> but, well, I mean, we're, thanks for doing the show. I always love yeah. talking to you. Again, we always match up pretty well on our whatever we're reading at the time. Where can everyone find you and support the odd man? Yeah, man. Thank you for having me once again. It's always a pleasure. So it's theoddmanout.podbean.com if you want to check out the show. And then I'm on Twitter and Instagram at under, underscore the odd man out. And then on Gab, it's just odd man out. So check me right. out, man. Nice. Dude. I'll put your link tree. Oh, wait, you got kicked off link tree, right? <laughs> yeah. So weird. So man. you're off link tree. You're not yeah. on there. Not on there. I mean, I just I clicked on it. I hadn't looked in a couple of months, you know, and I clicked on it and it said that I had misused Linktree and my account had been deleted. Good so, luck. Good. Another thing that will never be automated, uh, <laughs> trying to appeal anytime you're getting kicked off social media. But, yeah. And they didn't even send me an email or anything. So, yeah. well, thanks to everyone that's in the chat, Susan, Jeremy and Rosalind. So nice to hear your comments. And ah, man, thanks for being on the show. And we'll Thanks, do it bro. again soon, dude. Absolutely. All right, man. Take care. See you, man. See ya.